Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Let's dive into today's conversation regarding life's myriad transitions and how we refine our responses in our relationships, our wellness, our households, our work, and in our practices. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me a very unique and special human with whom I had the great privilege of sharing a stage several years ago who made such an impression on me that I wanted to have her here with us so that you, my listener, could meet her. Her name is Nadia Boltz Weber. She is an ordained Lutheran pastor. She is the founder of House for All Sinners and Saints in Denver. Uh, She is the creator and host of the Confessional podcast, and she is the author of three New York Times bestselling memoirs, Pastrix, The Cranky, Beautiful Faith of a Sinner and Saint, Accidental Saints, Finding God in All the Wrong People, and also Shameless, A Sexual Reformation. So Nadi writes and speaks about personal failings and recovery and grace and faith and really whatever the hell else she wants to. She always sits in the corner with the other weirdos, which is why her blog, which I love and subscribe to on Substack, is called The Corners. And that's her newsletter. And before we welcome you in, Nadia, as you say, quote, I write and speak about my personal failings, addiction, grace, faith, really whatever the hell else I want to. I always sit in the corner with the other weirdos. And it may feel as though some of us have been relegated to the corners. But here's the thing. From the corners, I can see the whole room. I love the corners. I always have. It is where I will always choose to sit because I love outcasts, queers, the girls who talk too loud. I love humor that comes out of lives that have not been easy. I love sober drunks, single dads, sex workers, and the guy who lost a leg in the war. These are my people. It's so nice to have you here, Nadia. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah. I want to talk first about your work in the women's prison. That's something very close to my heart. I'm part of an organization called On the Inside, where we bring uh, sort of creative endeavors, theater, art, music, all kinds of uh, ways of expression into women's prisons. And I know that you do work in the women's prison in Denver, and I would love to hear a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. So there is a Lutheran congregation. It's its own little congregation, but it meets inside the walls of the women's prison and is comprised exclusively of incarcerated women there. So it's not like a ministry of another church. You know, there are a lot of really kind of conservative churches who have different kinds of ministries in prisons. And I don't want to say denigrating things about them, but at New Beginnings, women who uh, are queer or don't even have a religious background, don't know what they believe. Everyone is welcome in that community. And um, I'm sort of a public figure in mainline Protestant Christianity, but I don't feel super comfortable in most of those congregations, even though they've read my books and they love me. Mm. Uh, And I feel totally comfortable at New Beginnings, mostly because it's just a wreck. You know, it's like the AV system is aggressively loud and, There may or may not be someone having a seizure in the back row and women have their dogs because there's a dog training program. (laughs) There's dogs at church and um, the women who show up, it's so deeply meaningful to them. And so I think it's like the pleasure of having something that's meaningful to me be really deeply meaningful to these incarcerated women as well. Whereas sometimes I go to other churches and it feels like it's the Elks Club with Eucharist. Like, it's just not my vibe at all. Well, yeah. The Elks Club. Do I have your permission to read an excerpt from your recent sermon in the prison on All Saints Day? Yeah, man. Go for it. So good. 
I mean, in the Lutheran tradition, saints aren't a special category of people who happen to be the opposite of sinners. In the Lutheran tradition, saints are just regular sinners who happen to be forgiven. That's all of us, by the way. But the thing I wanted to talk about today is how some grief is more complicated than others. Like, it's difficult to grieve a parent you loved but who was also a terrible mother. And it's difficult to grieve someone who we could still carry guilt over not treating as well as we could have. Or to grieve a friend who for sure slept with your man. (laughs) Note to readers, this line may not have flown in a traditional church setting, but it got an applause break in the women's prison. (laughs) Unbelievable. And I totally feel that. You go on to say that it's unavoidable, that at some point the fabric of our hearts will snag on the rough side of other people. And it can make grief pretty swirly and not so basic. And the rougher parts of us will snag the hearts of those we love and even those we don't mean to. We may hurt them. And when we die, the grief they feel will be complicated too. The whole thing just makes me cry. Yeah. The whole damn thing. Like, first of all, I just would like to thank you so much for putting words to the complexity of grieving someone who mistreated you or grieving the loss of someone whom you mistreated. These are things that we don't really talk about anywhere. Right. And I want to thank you. And this is really what I wanted to introduce to our listener today, because this is important shit that we don't address in words. You know, we sort of address it in our meditation or we address it in prayer in church or we address it in the synagogue, but we don't really talk about it. What has led you to this deep uh, well of insight around grief? Mm. Well, just fucking paying attention to reality. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Uh, And also my own grief, you know. I've had deep grief around friends who've died by suicide and that feeling of like, if I just called them last week when I thought to, you know, the sort of guilt that we carry that accompanies a lot of our grief complicates it. And basically I have what's called a low theological anthropology, which is just this like fancy way of saying, um, I just think uh, my view of human nature and what humans are capable of is pretty low. Now, that's not to say that I don't think that we're also uh, magnificent at times, capable of great beauty. I know we are. But I, like, try to never underestimate my ability to fuck something up. I try to remain sufficiently suspicious of myself. And a lot of the circles I travel in have very high anthropology. A lot of self-help stuff is like, if you can imagine it, you can create it. You can be anything you want. If you just have really positive thoughts, you'll stop being the shitty person you've always been. And um, I understand why that sounds hopeful, but When you actually play it out for any given amount of time in an actual human life, it ends up filling me with more despair than anything. Because if I can self-improve myself into a state of not being an asshole anymore, Mm. and I've worked really hard to do that, and I haven't managed to do it, then I'm irretrievably broken. Where's the hope? Right. So... I think the reason I can write about the things I do is that I have a stark and what I think is just realistic view of humans, but I think having that actually allows for hope in a way that having a high anthropology hasn't in my life. And part of it's just, you know, I've been in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for 30 years, man. It's like you see actual reality there. People aren't that lofty. You don't get there by having killed, you know, just killed it in life. You know, it's not like you you get there because you're desperate. And what I've seen is actual transformation. So if what we want is transformation on some level, in my experience, it's come – 
from the outside more than from the inside. And that's a very countercultural notion right now. But for me to actually experience transformation, it's usually because something knocks me on my ass. It's not usually Mm -hmm. because I just strive to improve myself. So thank Thank you for that. that. (laughs) You know, I appreciate the reality of that little conversation. And I think also there's a, an important tangent, which is not really a tangent that we have to go on. We met on the stage because of our shared commitment to sobriety. And that was a really sweet conversation, if I remember correctly, really moved me. And um, I would like to talk a little bit about sobriety and what that means for you, what that has been to you these last 30 years. I have eight as of now. Mm. Um, I'm feeling so much better than I've ever felt in my skin because of it. But to this point, I like the idea of talking about the fact that usually when there's a transformation that's happened, it's happened because of something that happened from the outside and some way in which you alchemized it from the inside, not because you were hopeful and manifesting. I can't even. That word. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I think, you know, I'm in, being an AA, there's this lovely line that says, like, we find that God is doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. And I love that. And I always just find that's where my hope is located. And so then my work is to go, how can I pay attention enough to know when that's happening? Like, how can I quiet all of the static around me enough to align myself with the divine in a way um, that's transformative. So that's very, I don't know, I guess that's just different than how can I create it myself. It's more of paying attention to something that already is rather than a creating something new out of nothing. Honestly, I think one of the most powerful things about 12-step work is the idea of rigorous honesty. That is the clincher. Man, how, where in the world do you see rigorous honesty. It just feels like it's so rare. Human beings were so precious and we're so darling and dear and wonderful and also just complete fucking liars. <laughs> like to ourselves and other people, you know, like, I mean, human beings capacity to fool ourselves is extraordinary. And the term sin is something that people are usually put off by, which I understand because it sounds like the super judgy, priggish label for naughty indulgences that good people don't partake in. But um, there's this writer I love named Francis Spufford, and he calls sin the human propensity to fuck things up, (laughs) which I love so much. It's become my favorite definition. But uh, it's the sufficient suspicion. Yeah, exactly. Remaining sufficiently suspicious of myself. Yes. And the fact is that like social psychologists have had a term for this for so long. They just call it cognitive bias. There are scientific studies of the ways that human beings are deceptive to ourselves. It's called cognitive bias. I mean, theologians have just always called it sin, you know, but I think it's the same thing. So it's this humbling awareness of how masterful we are at pretending something's true when it's not, you know? Right. Right. And by the way, that includes pretending we're worse than we are, right? Pretending we aren't worthy of being loved well. That also is deceit. Feeling bad falls into this category. Oh, I feel so bad. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's usually a camouflage for something else. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. I pulled from the blog. I've really been enjoying it. I pulled uh, the prayer for Sunday, June 26th of 2022. Hmm. <clears throat> Dear God. Oh, that was right after Roe v. Wade. I know. Yes. I know. That's okay. why I was right, like, sorry. and then it was yesterday the midterms, and it was just like, I don't know, I had a big cry around this one too. Dear God, the world has sought endlessly to quiet, hem in, shame, and control this body. Nevertheless, I persist in praising you that I was born a woman. And I thank you for the generations of other women whose well of wisdom and defiance and beauty and creativity I've drunk from, the waters 
of which have sustained me and set my shoulders back. Thank you for our ancestors in the faith who knew their dignity originated in you and not in the whims of those who sought to dominate them. Help me draw not upon the power of doom scrolling, but upon the power of Mary's song and Gail's hammer and Shipra and Pua's sneakiness and the Syrophoenician women's sass, which are all linked in the blog, and I would strongly recommend you go look. Thank you for the anger surging through this body that has conceived three and birthed two. Bless that anger, God, and direct it. And if there's any left over, let it not destroy me or those I love, but burn it off with the heat of pleasure and desire. And if the road ahead is long, Lord, and I fear it will be. Oh, I love this part. May there be belly laughing. May there be mutual consolation. May there be rest. May there be song. And I am serious about this one, God. May there be snacks. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking snacks. Sorry to curse. For this and that, I have no words. I thank you. May these prayers of gratitude turn my fear into faith and my rage into purpose. Amen. <laughs> That one carried me yesterday. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful! Just so beautiful. Um, who are your writing inspirations? You're such a prolific, talented, skillful, concise writer and editor. Oh, who are my writing inspirations? Well, I mean, I would say my first one, the first person's writing who I read that made me feel like I wasn't alone like made me feel like they had a glimpse into the weirdness that is me was definitely Anne Lamott who wrote traveling mercies and plan B and so many books. Um, and she's now become a friend, which is extraordinary, but, uh, she's a beautiful writer. My friend, um, Sarah miles is a beautiful writer as well. My writing is so, um, to say it's personal, I'm not saying, oh, I just write about myself endlessly. What I mean when I say it's personal is I'm writing for myself almost always. So when I was in my parish, I haven't been in my parish for four and a half years, but when I was a parish priest, my parishioners said that they loved having a preacher who was clearly preaching to herself and just letting them overhear it. And so... I, there it is right there. Yeah, I that's still it. that's still that's what I do. I go, what is the most honest thing I can say right now? And how can I say it in a way that's true and beautiful? I try to never default to sentimentality or to cliche. What I don't do is go, well, what would be helpful for other people to hear me say? <laughs> like, I think if I ever started doing that, I'd be doomed. Uh, I'm just, it just wouldn't sound like, you. no. And I'm just super lucky that, uh, other people seem to be fucked up in very similar ways to me, to me. Right. <laughs> right. right. So they go, Oh, I feel like throughout the pandemic, every Sunday I wrote prayers like that. And all I did was make myself a cup of coffee on Sunday morning, sit in my yellow chair and go, what is the most honest thing I can say to God right now about what I'm afraid of? what I'm struggling with, what I need, where my hope might lie, all of that. And then I would do that as honestly as I could. And then I'd publish it. And then every week people are like, oh, how do you know? Like, how do you crawl inside of me and say the thing I needed to hear and didn't know that those were the words I needed? And the fact is I didn't. I just did that for myself. And it just happens to align with other people. The fact is we're all really one ginormous organism yeah. yeah, in a real way. And when I resonate with you, it's just because we're human and you took the time to listen and write it down. <laughs> I consider just in the past few years, I've sort of started saying that I live a contemplative life. And I, I never use that word because I always thought – to be a contemplative meant that you have like 20 minutes of meditation morning and night. You have this rigorous practice around stuff like that. 
And that's not me. But the fact is, is that I have enough space in my life that I have a lot of time to consider. Like I spend a lot of time walking outside. I have conversation partners who help me um, articulate ideas in our conversations. I read, I listen to novels. I do all of these things. And that space that I have is what allows me to do the writing I do. I just finished writing a sermon for this Sunday for Inside the Prison And it's just days of me thinking about the text I'm preaching on. And I think about it when I'm in the shower. I think about it on my walk. I think about it, you know, I'll have a conversation with a friend. And at the end, I'll be like, hey, can you talk about the text for Sunday with me? And all of a sudden, we're having a a little text study on the phone call. Like, my brain will start thinking about the text I'm preaching on in the middle of the night if I wake up. It's like having a not very interesting mental illness, basically, is that I'm just obsessed with certain ideas. And I get to spend a lot of time with them uh, to figure out what the words are to say about them. And I'm really grateful for the time that I have because it allows the writing. Mm, I feel that. I have a lot of writers that listen to this podcast. So I really, and I myself am a writer, and I always marvel at people like you, like Annie Lamott, who have such a capacity to just speak from within themselves without really worrying about what anyone's going to think without trying to be useful. Yeah, without trying to be useful. Yeah, I I love that. I I think that's a great, great way to put that. Yeah. 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 I had Sam on the podcast earlier this year. He was such a joy. And I have a dream of having Anne Lamott on my podcast sometime in 2023. Yeah. She's such a powerhouse. Um, I would love, lastly, to address the various aspects of your service, not your sermon service, but your general overall service, aside from the women's prison. What else do you do so that our listener can find you easily? Oh, uh, not very much. (laughs) (laughs) If I can help it. (laughs) As little as possible, actually. (laughs) I I do up to one thing a day. (laughs) Right. That's, uh, that's the max. Let's see. No, I have a very small life here. You know, like mm. I, I really, I do. When I leave, my life gets bigger. But here at home, it's small. Uh, well, I do. I write on the corners at Substack. And, um, you know, I might be getting back to my podcast. I'm, my first memoir was option to be made into a TV show. So I've been spending months creating it with um, the showrunner from Grey's Anatomy. So we're pitching it Monday uh, to FX. And so there's a possibility that that will be created. We'll see. And if that- um, Wow. Yeah, it's weird. H- hold the line for just a moment. Wow. <laughs> That's Pastrix? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. Can you help our listener understand a little bit about that? the sort of trajectory of the book? Yeah, I think it's just like, you know, girl raised fundamentalist becomes very messy addict and alcoholic who uh, sleeps around more than she should, does stand-up comedy because she can't afford therapy, gets sober, and somehow 10 years later ends up being ordained a pastor and starting a church for people who are just as odd as she is and would never darken the door of a church if she hadn't started one. So that's the basic wow. premise of the book. Yeah. And who knows? Um, I mean, who's going to play you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm learning this world. I don't know anything about Hollywood, but um, for every thousand books that are optioned, maybe one ends up getting made into a pilot. And out of every hundred pilots that are made, maybe one ends up a show. So, you know, it's like... I see, I see, I see. Yeah. uh, It's one of those. So you have to kind of hold it lightly. Yeah, it's probably an interesting exercise, though, for you to kind of stay centered and grounded and on point, on purpose, on your sort of vows, as it were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's been a lesson in patience and powerlessness, (laughs) to be honest. So, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the ego will screw us over at any opportunity, you know, while making us think it wants the best for us. (laughs) So, you know, COVID was good for the ego for me because 
And by that, I mean bad, because in 2019, I was on 90 airplanes. I was in seven countries. And then in 2020, I was in my apartment. And so it ends up, there's no business class seating in my apartment. And um, I'm not, it ends up. Yeah, I'm, I'm not special in my apartment. And so it was this whole recalibration of who I am. And the thing that I keep saying is like, if somebody had asked me a month into the into COVID, do you think you could do this for the next 13 months? I'd be like, no, I can't. There's no way I can't just stay in my apartment. But it wasn't that I couldn't do it. It's that I was not yet familiar with the version of me who could do it. And that's who I met, you know. And so now my practice is to try to not default to a pre-pandemic version of myself and to try to figure out who I am now, you know. And so anyway, yeah. That is profound. I'm silent because Mm -hmm. I'm actually celebrating right now the version of you and the version of me that have emerged from this pandemic. It was highly challenging and highly important, I think, yeah. for many of us. Yeah. Yeah. To meet that person. I know. I know. And there hasn't been a human society that has surrounded itself with quite so much comfort and convenience as ours. And then seen it as normative. And it's not normative. You know, in the history of humanity, it's not normal. And so we had less convenience and less comfort and it was a crisis. <laughs> you know? uh, so I don't know in a big way I know I know, I know. so yeah. but I don't know if you've ever read Sebastian Junger but I was on stage with him a couple months ago and he's an anthropologist by training but um, he was embedded with soldiers and wrote that book Tribe which was so powerful but he said something I can't get over which is Throughout human history, life has been very traumatic. Like, there, it's brutal. Human life throughout human history has mostly been brutal. And he said, but what that tells us, you know, babies born today are biologically identical to babies that were born during the Ice Age, okay? So, like, we have the same hardware. The hardware hasn't changed. And we are wired to be able to survive trauma. If trauma was incapacitating for a lifetime, like people seem to think it is right now, (laughs) literally our species would not exist. We are wired to heal from trauma, to get over it, to not have it be incapacitating. And I think that is a tremendous message to be talking about right now, because the definition of trauma has expanded so much to include anything that made us sort of uncomfortable or unhappy. And I think there are ways in which it's crippling. So I try to remind myself, I am part of this group of social primates that has been on this planet not that long, but that we have this beautiful wiring. We have this ability to survive horrible things. Like, I think that's extraordinary and still be okay. Such a beautiful way to actually end us off um, with that sentiment for our listener. Ooh, where can our listener find you? Uh, let's see, the corners.substack.com. I, I think that's it. <laughs> I should know. That's the one. Okay, I should if, know. You, <laughs> but it's- if you liked one sentence that Nadia said today, go yeah. to her Substack. I promise you will never be disappointed. It is so rich, oh, thanks. layered. Thanks. It's just beautiful. I'm the Christian people can stomach. I think that's going to be on my business card. <laughs> I think you should put that everywhere on your forehead. <laughs> I'm the Christian people can stomach. Last question, actually. I have one more question. What's up? Sorry. I want to understand the difference between all the different um, variations of Christianity. Can you enlighten me, please? That is a huge question. Okay. I I will say broadly, until about the 16th century, basically what we know is like Roman Catholicism was the only game in town. And then there was this... Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. And in 1517, he wrote down 95 things he thought were pretty screwed up about the church. And he posted them on the door of the Wittenberg church. 
And he said, let's have a conversation about these things because I think they're pretty whack. And that's what started the Protestant Reformation. And so the traditions that are just one step away from Roman Catholicism are Anglicanism, which we know as Episcopalians, and Lutherans. So we are very old in our traditions. And then what happened is it spun out into a million little tiny other traditions things like Baptists and Anabaptists and um, blah, blah, blah. So in the States, we have Roman Catholicism. We have some Eastern Orthodoxy, which is kind of its own thing. And then in Protestantism, you have mainline Protestants. So those are our Methodists, Presbyterians, UCC, Reformed, Lutheran, Episcopalians. And they tend to be a little more progressive. Many of them ordained women, stuff like that. And then you have evangelical or free church traditions. And those run more like um, the big churches that have the bands on the stage and their pastors don't have to go to seminary and they have a lot of sort of uh, political leverage and social conservatism. And a lot of them will not ordain women. Most of them won't. So that's about as simply as I can tell you. Yeah, that's highly appreciated. Um, I recall some bits of this, but now I'm happy to have it all in the hard drive here. I, I'll tell you, House for All Sinners and Saints, we had a logo that looked like a piece of parchment with a nail at the top, kind of like Martin Luther's 95 Theses. And we had T-shirts that had that on the front. And on the back, it said, Radical Protestants nailing shit to the church door since 1517. Oh, that's genius. Those were our church shirts, yeah. <laughs> oh, I got it. When you said that, I was like, oh, of course I remember that story from history class. Yeah, and of yeah. course, that's what you chose, because that is what you do yeah. with every moment of your world, yeah. is just to ask the question. Well, and I'll tell you, this is something people might not intuit in my writing, but I'm actually a really orthodox Lutheran theologian. So, so much of what I say in my preaching and in my writing, you really can ideologically sort of uh, trace it back to Martin Luther. Yeah. Hmm. It's not that original. <laughs> well, you know, there's nothing better than a teacher who remains a student, who remains deeply connected to the ancient roots of whatever it is that they are uh, teaching. Yeah. Yeah. That's everything right there. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for being here, Nadia. Really, it was such a treat to meet you back then and such a treat to know you now. Yeah, same. Thanks for the invitation. I hope your listeners enjoyed it. I hope so too. And thank you for listening and thank you for being here. Thanks.